Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbacher.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy show. Today we have one of my favorite humans in, in, the, in the office. Uh, and I say that not facetiously. He's actually a, an incredible human. His wife's awesome. Uh, and I've been grateful to get to know him. Uh, I'll let him tell the story of how we met. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's incredible to be able to work with um, Keaton Patey. He's with US Health Advisors. And if you don't know what he's doing, you need to because it's on the it's on the election ballot this year, which by the time this comes out, probably will have already happened. But it's a real deal, like worrying about where health insurance is going in the future, what that looks like and, and why there's such a major hullabaloo about it. And so we'll get some good insight there. Um, but yeah, Keaton, thanks for joining us. Um, how did uh, tell the story of how we first met? I want, I want them to really get it from somebody else's perspective. What does Sam what does Sam like? first meeting here. Yeah, sure thing. So I, oh, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, but I was at FitCon. It was a, doing a booth event there. It's a fitness conference. Lots of different people show up there. You got families, you got guys who are just in college. You also have guys that they're so jacked, they can't put their arms down to their side and they're walking around all tan and unnatural colors. And as I was sitting there kind of prospecting, talking to people about the health insurance that I work with, um, Sam walks by, right? And so I go in and I say, Hey, um, I work with health insurance for healthy people. What are you doing for your health insurance? So Sam didn't even turn his torso towards me. He goes, no, you know, you can't help me. And I was like, well, how do you know that? Because we have, I can't even tell you what I can do for you. And he's like, trust me, you can't help me. And so I'm a persistent guy, which is why Sam and I get along so well. And I was like, well, give me a shot. Let me see what I can do. All right, give me a shot. And so he turned around and goes, okay, I'm only paying, I think it was $16 a month for my entire family. And obviously the second he said that, I knew he was taking advantage of some government programs, which I can also help you do if you have questions about it. But right off the bat, Sam was just like, look, if you're going to engage with me, engage with me all the way. And so I did. And we, we actually exchanged each other's numbers, even though I didn't help him out with health insurance right then. Um, we've become good friends and where our offices are really close. They're always bouncing ideas back and forth. We work in very similar insurance industry. So yeah, if you, Sam says he's going to tell it to you straight, he's not lying. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. So I'm curious then since you met me and now that you've, you've worked with me in many different capacities from, from coaching, um, working with your, your money, what, what's, do you feel like your opinion has changed from when you first met me to who I am now, or it's just gotten more, more fleshed out? <laughs> probably more fleshed out. <laughs> um, so still the same, you're always saying exactly how it is. And, and the things with money is it's emotionless. If you leave it on the table, it, it won't do anything. It'll just, it'll just be. And so, um, I think one time we were talking, you said, I have to be the type of person that can call and tell you that I lost all your money and you're okay with that. I said, okay, makes sense. And so Sam, ever since that first day has always not only told me exactly how it is, but there's no fluff, there's no BS, which allows you to get to the root of what he does, which is help you with your financial problems, which for the majority, you need to be able to take your emotion out of it and let money do what money does. Yeah, that's awesome. No, it's, it's, always, it's always funny to hear what people's experiences are. One thing that I, so we actually went down to a Mexican restaurant after we mm -hmm. met like a month later. On, It was like a month later, we went down to a Mexican restaurant and Keaton shared his story with me, which is pretty crazy. And it got crazier after we met. Uh, yep. <laughs> cause, cause Keaton's like been around the block. He's experienced lots of things in his life, uh, but kind of start at the beginning. Cause I want to, <laughs> I don't know where the beginning is for you, but when you first started learning all your different languages, moving, like what, what was your household like growing up just in general? <laughs> sure thing. So my dad, he's always been an entrepreneur. He doesn't, he's done everything from software development to, excuse me, long-term land holdings. And so it got to the point where 
you know, he'd be at home for a couple months and we'd see him now and then. And then all of a sudden there'd be five or six months where he'd be just a total ghost, like, you know, just working all day, every day. So it was kind of weird growing up in a household like that. I didn't really, as far as work was defined, I feel like I had a very unique definition of what that was. Um, but my, I come from a big family. My mom had twins twice. So there's twins, three kids in the middle and twins again. So in other words, if she doesn't get into heaven, there's no way I'm, I'm ever getting in. Um, so she's <laughs> a saint. Here, brother. <laughs> <laughs> she's a saint for sure. And so um, when my dad, uh, he sold a pharmaceutical company along with a software company in 2006, uh, he picked up our whole family. We moved to the Azorian Islands of Portugal. If you don't know where that is, it's because it doesn't show up on a lot of maps. It's about 800 miles off the coast of Portugal. It pertains to Portugal, but it's actually in the smack dab in the middle of the Atlantic and actually doesn't, shouldn't, I think, pertain to any country because Portugal doesn't do anything to help them at all. <laughs> <laughs> so the island I grew up on was about um, 22 to 25 square miles. And so um, you can imagine driving that. Most of you probably commute farther than that on your way to work every day. Um, on the island, there were five cows to every person. Um, so their main industry was fish and uh, dairy products. So I grew up on a farm milking cows. So the Portuguese I learned in Portugal was very inappropriate slang farm language. The most important <laughs> the kind. The most right? important kind, yep. And so um, I did, I went to Portuguese schools there. Uh, my parents actually both served LDS missions in Portugal. So they also spoke Portuguese and always wanted to teach us, which is why we ended up in Portugal. Um, but then I moved back from there. Um, well, I should touch on another story. So milking cows every day at 4.30, it sucked. I hated it all growing up. But one thing that it taught me is not only that the world will continue to function with or without you. So the more you participate in, the more return you get. Um, but I always joke, it also taught me how to pray. Because I get up every morning and I pray that those cows would die. There have been some like <laughs> monsoon or something and they all be wiped out. But never happened, right? I got up every morning and they were still there, still needed to be milked and gonna take care of. So taught me a lot about work ethic, about how to just, you know, the systems that you participate in, no matter what your industry is, if you're a realtor, if you're like me and work with health insurance, or you're like you, Sam, do the financial insurance and financial advising, right? It, no matter what industry you're in, it will happen with or without you. So the more you participate in, not only the more return you get, but the bigger change you can, you can get inside of that. So lessons from a, a cow milking kid in the middle of the Atlantic ocean. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of saying that. I've never heard anybody put it that way, but I like it. I'm going to steal it <laughs> because enough. it's awesome. And Keaton's generous. He'll let me steal it from him. Yep. But I'll, so, I'll so get credit on this video and I probably won't get it again. Only. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm good at giving credit. I heard somebody say though, you only have to give credit like five times and then it's yours. Like, yeah. At some point, you're, you said it. Yeah. No. At some point, everybody who heard it, they heard it first from you. Uh huh. You said it. Yeah, you said it. And it's funny because <laughs> people would be like, well, you you stole that from somebody else. I'm like, sort of, but like, what wasn't stolen from somebody else? <laughs> like anytime anybody talks about peace, you basically stole that from Christ. Well, no, you're regurgitating, yeah, regurgitating you're, knowledge and rhetoric. <laughs> no, it's just, it just is. But yeah, I will, I'll give you credit for it. Okay, good. good. Yeah, um, so there I was in Portugal. Came back from that kind of takeoff where we were just talking about. I got back from the States. I finished uh, high school in, in Midway, Utah, uh, at which point I graduated early because European school systems were a year ahead. So I then went to Germany. I studied uh, German and architecture. I wanted to be an architect, wanted to design homes. And the more I got into the design part, I realized that like, I actually wanted to see the structures go up. And, and be more in the building part of that. And so um, at this point, I spoke English, um, Portuguese, and German. I then came back, and I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the church. I'm, a, I'm an LDS guy. And so I then served a mission in Brazil using Portuguese. So Portuguese at this point, I've been speaking it since I was really young. It's like a second language. And so if you know anyone who's health insurance, help in Portuguese, you know, my shameless plug right there, I can or help Spanish. them out. Or Spanish. Or Spanish. You can figure it out in Spanish. I know they're like... Yeah, like English, and so, European English versus American English. Yeah, European so I then, the I then learned period. Spanish after the mission as well. So definitely can help with Spanish. But um, yeah, I, I, I then as I was getting into construction and realizing that I love the world and want to see more of it, I studied Chinese at BYU. And so I speak Portuguese, Spanish, English, German and some Chinese and I sell health insurance. And I love it. Which, which, by the way, I mean, I, I don't know all of those languages. I know on my mission, I did have to learn a little bit of Chinese, Mandarin to, to communicate. And I learned some Russian and some Polish. And I learned some different languages. 
to communicate. Not that I'm fluent in any of them. He's actually fluent in them. But I think the hardest is probably health insurance to learn. <laughs> <laughs> I don't say license in that. <laughs> it's a freaking joke. And um, yeah, I'm licensed in it, but I, I, I hate it. I mean, it's, it is confusing. It doesn't make sense to me. I'm grateful that Keaton does that um, because it's, it's hell. <laughs> so you're kind of back to that same same quote right because it's hard other people won't touch it which is why i like it because i can do hard stuff and i can make the easy the hard things seem a lot easier yeah and uh he's good at that but yeah i'm not touching it <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's I mean, that's crazy so so how old are you 26 26 so 26 years old knows like five languages has been cultured as far as living in different cultures different disciplines architecture farming insurance he, are you okay to talk about your land deal or is that off the books because it's under yeah you, you can litigation. talk about it just to- this is so crazy guys this is just to show how dumb some humans are <laughs> uh, to put it lightly and um, how if you're not vigilant um, you can be taken advantage of right so so yeah tell because when i met him this hadn't happened yet he was just like yeah we own this piece of land it's it's invested with my dad and some other people and i was like that's cool like i don't own anything other than Mm -hmm. my house which is i own my house but i don't own an investment property Mm -hmm. well let's just hear how that went yeah so uh like i said my dad has done everything from from software engineering to pharmaceuticals and and land deals and so uh, we owned a piece of property out in western utah I say owned, it is current. I just need to refer to the present tense. I kind of just say you owned wish it was owned, in the though. past tense, like it was, it was behind me, but it's yes. not. Uh, and so one thing that we didn't realize is we were, there was different partnerships there. The land had lots of different interests. There were parties that had come and done construction there and not been paid by previous owners. And then when we purchased it, they then came to try to collect with us. But then I don't know if you know what a bona fide port purchaser is, right? But because we didn't know about it, they're litigating saying, well, this wasn't presented as we bought the property. And to say the least, uh, you need to protect yourself, right? So we had super, super, super high litigation risk on this property and had no idea, right? And so, I mean, same, same thing. It, and that's what Sam does with finances, right? And if you have a lot of money and you have a lot of different places you can put it, he makes sure he puts it in safe places, right? So I invested a a lot of time, a lot of sweat equity into that. And also a lot of my own cash. I also did summer sales for a while. So instead of buying a new Mustang or a new truck at the end, I just took the whole lump sum and invested it back into what we were doing there on those properties. But yeah, litigation sucks and it takes a long time and there's nothing worse than a, a lawsuit about something you weren't advised about when you purchased the property, locking up assets for six, well, at this point, two years. <laughs> so so if you are from utah and you've ever gone to wendover you've probably stopped at this piece of property <laughs> what's this <laughs> so it's it's dell dell utah dell utah it's, a, it's little... the last gas station on the way in between salt lake and wendover yeah what is it sinclair or something uh, it's, I don't even know. Whatever it's it changed. But... It's dinky. It's <laughs> run down. Not because of not because of the owners, but the tenants did some funny things. Talk about what the tenants did. So yeah, tenants because they wanted because they wanted the property. Uh huh. The tenants that had with the previous purchaser had had an option to buy. Um, their option expired. They then went to try to execute and take their option, even though it was way outside of their parameter to do so. Um, they didn't maintain the property well. There was like there was a leak with a gas line, and the EPA was everywhere. And and so, needless to say, if if you ever have, it's kind of like that employee. The second the employee comes and asks for a raise, and you tell him no, you can expect that something will go missing from your personal property. <laughs> That's what happens. We told the tenant and said, no, you can't renew your lease. No, we're not going to let you practice your previous option, which is no longer valid to purchase this property. And he kind of just trashed it from there. We had some personal vehicles on the property. We had lots of, of our own stuff stored there on the property. There's a warehouse, there's an old auto shop and went back and people had taken sledgehammers to our cars, had broken into one of the storage units there and stole personal items and other business and farm equipment. So yeah, if you ever have someone who has the ability to screw you hard and you then tell them, no, take a hike. Like we're not renewing your lease. You can't buy a property from us. Expect him to do shady shit. Yeah. So <laughs> blackmail is just better paid than 
<laughs> I just, <laughs> but really though, I mean, you have to think about that, like other areas of your life, because it's not just business. I think, mm-hmm. I think every aspect of life, it applies to like those, those things that happens with your relationships, happens with your kids, happens with your spouses, happens with your, your boss and things like that. And then one thing is how do you choose not to be that person? happiness is where your expectations and realities meet. And I'm a firm believer of never lowering your expectations because you should expect a lot from life. Um, but definitely if no, someone is expecting more for you for no, for no exchange of value, like they just want more and you just tell them no, because they're not, they're not even meeting the expectations they said they would. That's the person that you want to get out of your life, whether it's a girlfriend or whether it's a business partner, even if it's your neighbor, right. Who just expects things from you with even, with not even any prior knowledge or agreement of what's going on there. You can expect some drama from that guy. <laughs> Truer words have not been spoken. I, I, for, I don't know if I agree completely and I don't know. I think it comes down to what we, D- define as expectation. I agree mm-hmm. with pretty much everything he said. I think I would just define expectation differently in this one sentence that he used. But I'm okay having low expectations because mm-hmm. that means I get every day. Every day, I'm grateful for how well people show up. Mm-hmm. So, so it's not that I'm lowering my expectations of life and things because mm-hmm. I don't want that anything better. Mm-hmm. I'm still pursuing the greatest. I just expect the worst. So I'm always satisfied with my results. There you go. So I can live in gratitude, but maybe I, maybe that holds me back. I should expect more. I think you should expect almost oh, so being religious, right? Yeah, sure. I think sure. your, your creator or some people call him God. Some people call him sure. whatever it might be mother nature. Right. I think she wants good things. In fact, the best things that the world can offer. I think she wants that for everyone. Now, do people go out there and get it or take advantage of it? Not as much because, like I said, the systems that would make that happen will happen with or without you. Yeah, sure. So, so maybe there's a difference in again. So, see, this is why I love these podcasts because we get to just brainstorm. But the difference is expecting doesn't necessarily mean that you deserve something. So, I think a lot of people when they say they expect something to happen, mm-hmm. they think, "Hey, if I put in X amount of whatever, then I expect something." And when they say the word expect, they really mean I believe I deserve Mm -hmm. and that if you don't, then you cheated me of some sort. Mm -hmm. And I just don't have that type of expectation. Mm -hmm. I have an expectation. I learned this. Let's, let's quote a guy. He's a good friend. uh, ER is his name, but we were so so funny story about this whole shebang. I was on (laughs) a bachelor trip out to Wendover. We were in the back of an RV and we ended up stopping in this, this, Gas station. Yeah, this gas station. I did not know this story at this point, but uh, actually I knew the story, but I didn't know that I was stopping at that gas station Mm -hmm. until later. But it was on that car ride where we were all sitting back there. Um, They were getting very intoxicated. Mm -hmm. I was not, but we were having this conversation. He's a very successful businessman. And he said that he expects people to be expedient. And I was like, I never heard that before. Like, what Mm -hmm. does the word expedient mean? Mm Mm-hmm. Do you know what the word expedient means? I found the definition he used it. I, I was like, what does that mean? Like forthcoming? I don't know. Like, so, so this is, I'm going to look it up in the dictionary, but basically expedient uh, as he explained it. And I was like, okay, I, I'm on board for that definition of expedient. I'm going to look on dictionary.com as we're, as we're chatting here. But um, essentially it means you're going to do what's in your best interests all the time or what you believe is in your best interest. Expedient. I don't even know how to spell the word though. Here, my phone will tell me. Expedient. Okay, so according to dictionary.com, it says tending to promote some proposed or desired object fit or suitable for the purpose proper under the circumstances, conducive to advantage or interest as opposed to right, right? So we're not looking for people. I I don't expect people to do what is right. Mm -hmm. Um, I expect them to act in accordance with expediency or what is most advantageous to them. Right. Okay. So that's what I decided. My expectation is is that humans are going to behave expediently. And that's that's what he said. And I was like, that's really, Mm -hmm. when, when I think of what I do, 
I agree. Now you think, well, the person who's poor, so let's say the homeless person who doesn't have very much money, you go give them ten dollars. Is it really expedient for them to go give half of it to their friend? Right? Some people would say, no, that's not advantageous. Mm-hmm. Because you think differently than they do. For, from their perspective, though, they think if I share now, they will share when they get some money. Mm-hmm. Right? So in their current reality, it actually is most expedient, most advantageous to live communally rather than individually. Mm-hmm. Because they may not always have what they need in those dire circumstances. So it is actually expedient for them to do that, even though you and I might say, well, I keep it for yourself, right? Like mm-hmm. survive, you got survive, survival of the fittest. Well, their way of survival of the fittest is to communally live. So anyways, it's just an interesting thing. I expect people to be expedient and I rarely am shocked or, or, or have like, have that not fulfilled. Mm-hmm. And when it's something like I just explained that doesn't seem expedient to me, mm-hmm. then rather than questioning or, or, or thinking that my rule has been broken, that people are expedient, I choose to, I get really curious and I'm like, why the hell did you just do that? Like, what were you thinking? Like, what made that the right thing for you? Yeah. Because I want to learn about people and want to learn about what motivates people. Both Keaton and I, we've been in some sort of sales industry for Mm -hmm. who knows. And that's selling religion, (laughs) selling whatever, right? Um, And and it's true. You got to learn what actually move somebody and why Mm -hmm. Uh, and so it's it's a way to learn but i think that people are expedient i expect them to be expedient Mm -hmm. i i definitely agree with that i think the only part where i think it comes back to the definition i was using was people who will, will show up and expect the best from themselves and expect the best from others are my people right so if they act expediently which isn't isn't a progressive, right? It's not changing. It's not evolving. It's not leveling up that they naturally just by how I structure my time won't be around me anymore. So, so let let me clarify that if their form of expediency doesn't Mm -hmm. match it match, like if they don't see the same things as being expedient for themselves, Mm -hmm. then they won't hang around. Well, we naturally won't be in the same circle anymore. Right. So So for for me expecting the best or having high expectations of of someone. But why, why is that expedient for you? That's what I'm saying. Like why for you, why do you think it's in your best interest to be leveling yourself up? Let's see how to answer that question. Why is it my best interest to be always leveling up? Because it's expedient for you to Mm -hmm. be always seeking growth and be, Mm -hmm. be increasing your advantage and leveling up. So you only want to hang around with those people, Mm -hmm. but but why is it important for you to do that? I just hate the idea of either even going, okay, here's, here's the story I have. So I have a little sister. Her name is Eliza. She is severely disabled, right? She has something called synesthesia. And that's where you have five senses and they're crosswired. As of right now, whoever's listening to this, or even you and I, we each part of our body is connected to a one of the five senses, right? Touch, taste, smell, hearing. Oh, I think I missed one. I don't know. Anyway. There's actually 29 senses, just in case you want to know. <laughs> so the main five ones, but in, in yeah. her case, you know, when she sees color, she hears sound, right? So strong color contrast is making a sound, right? Texture is taste. Um, designs also make sounds, right? And there's people who have this, like there's composers who who will close their eyes as they're hearing a melody and see color blending. And based on the color blend, they know the music is sounding good, right? So uh, my little sister is super dear to my heart. And it's actually one of the reasons I went to BYU to study their therapeutic recreational management program. Um, but when I left on my mission, she digressed for the first time, right? And I can't say it was just connected to me, but up to that point in her life, she had slowly, right? At the time when I left, she was, still probably four year old, four years old developmentally, even though she was closer to all oh, the time would have been like 12. And so, but she'd always continually progress. And, and watching her struggle and then start to relearn habits that she'd already overcome was not only like super hard for me to watch and super hard for me to experience, especially because I couldn't be there. I was gone for two years. And when I came back, 
I had seen moments where my parents, I don't fault them. I love my parents and I don't have a disabled child. So I, I can't even begin to fathom what it's like trying to handle with that. I mean, she, she's finally at the point where she can go outside and she can be out in a park and not all of a sudden see some kid with a neon green shirt and feel like there's a foghorn blowing. Right. And so I can't fathom what that's like, but, but I feel like any point that someone doesn't expect, encourage and help you level up, they're almost doing you a disservice. Yeah. I would right? agree. And, and so around that basis is kind of like a general story and a general belief that I have. I, I strive to be that person. Right. If you're, if we're not, if the people I'm hanging out with or spending time with in socially business, spirituality and church on Sunday, whatever it might be, if we're all not collectively going somewhere or changing or finding a new insight or finding something else to apply to a facet of your life, they aren't the people I want to be hanging out with. And they're, they're not bad people. They're probably great. You know, if I met them in different circumstances and didn't have that, be fine. But I, I no longer seek their time right there. I mean, never take advice from someone you wouldn't switch places with, right? Uh, their counsel or advice, which typically tends to be very different than what I'm thinking. It just, it just doesn't apply to me. It's true for them. But for me, it, it's just in one ear and out the other, because they're not, not only doing themselves a disservice, but they're not, I can't help them and they can't help me. And with that rule of expecting the best to help everybody progress, myself included, they just don't get my time. Yeah, I think it's so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll glance past this, but, <laughs> but I think it's a re study quantum physics and you understand why that happens uh, from an energy perspective, why those people tend to either fall out of your life or they just don't ever cross because they're on literally different. They're, they're living in different realities and their uh, their quantum physical plane of existence, energy plane they just will never meet. Mm -hmm. Like it's like a clash of some craziness when it, when it, whenever it does happen that they, they come in contact with each other. I've had multiple people when I, um, when I talk to people the way I talk to Kian <laughs> and most of the people hang out with me, honestly, when, when I have those, those clashes where it's like, I'm, I'm speaking my language, how I communicate, and I'm speaking that to somebody who's on a different plane, not necessarily lower or higher, just different plane where they don't believe in creation, they don't believe in accountability, they don't believe in certain aspects of what are core beliefs of mine. They, they will, you, you tell them this, like, it can't be. That's, that's terrifying and it, it really scares them and they'll run from that information. They'll talk over you. If you think of like the Dumb and Dubber movie where they're both arguing and the ones <laughs> in the center going, ah, right? Mm -hmm. That's like, they will be that way because they just can't handle that plane of existence. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad or good. It's just, it's just different. And they're mm -hmm. and same, same thing for me, right? It's not just they can't handle it. When I go and I try and be around people who think like that, I, I get uncomfortable and I'm like, okay, I gotta leave. I, I can't, I can't continue to marinate in this awkward plane that I don't feel comfortable in. So I remove right. myself from, from their world just as quickly as they would remove themselves from my world. So neither one is right or wrong. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that there's no good or bad. It's just like, where are you comfortable? For me, I'm comfortable in, in a transcendent motion to a higher plane. And if I'm just like stagnating at a certain plane, then I don't, I don't like it very much. I'm with you. So it's, it's hard for my wife sometimes. Cause she's like, are you ever going to stop? No, oh, probably not. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. Probably not. <laughs> That's funny. So let's talk about health insurance. Cause uh, again, we've talked about how much I hate health insurance. I hate to, the, the activity of helping somebody with health insurance, mm -hmm. but why is health insurance such but one, what happened with Obamacare the first time? Like, how did that impact the industry? And why does it like have to get repaired somehow, some way? Like, why is this a necessity? It's not like a, oh, well, Trump's going to do this or Biden's going to do this or the Supreme Court's going to do this. It's like, at some point, things have to change. It's not a matter of if they're going to change. They have to change for anybody to be taken care of properly. So, mm -hmm. yeah, let's, about let's jump into it. So o Obamacare, right? It's called the Affordable Care Act or the ACA uh, now, first to preface, I think it was a beautiful idea. Sure, and, great idea. And, and I think we were, were a, actually a blessed country for trying to figure out a way to take care of our poor and take care of our old. And anyone listening to this, if you have grandparents, if you have 
older aunts and uncles, they benefit from this system. But, but let me just explain briefly what's happening there. So let's say, you know, you own an insurance company. And the government says, okay, anyone who's under $16,000 a year or over 65, you have to help them obtain health care at a quarter of the price that you would normally charge. And they say, okay, well, you know, how's that going to work? They say, well, there's going to be connected to their income, right? We're going to start monitoring how much money someone's making to see how much they should pay for their health insurance. Now, there's some people who can who have lower income or business owners who can report their income low. They can take advantage of that and they can get a f- extremely affordable health insurance. But what happens is people in the middle who are higher income, typically $100,000 is the cutoff. If you're a single individual, it's like 42. If you're a couple, it's 60. But with those different brackets, the second you're over that, the insurance company to try to make up for the losses they're experiencing on Medicare and then low income clients will charge the person making good income twice as much, right? So a plan that's for a young couple and maybe two kids, right? That if their income is 30,000 a year, that plan is gonna be like $200 a month for that person. The second that dad gets a raise and mom starts a side gig and all of a sudden they clear 80, that same health insurance policy is now $1,100, $1,200 a month which even with that increase in income, they are almost never financially prepared to pay a small mortgage for something that they almost don't use because they're healthy anyway. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. So, so it's good for, I, I, I'm open about this. I don't really care. I totally, so at first, when it first came out, I was like, I'm not going to use government subsidies because I think it's wrong. Mm-hmm. Took this super principle, whatever, blah, 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 blah. Okay. But just like, uh, Keaton said, it's going to happen with or without you. Mm -hmm. Like me not participating in it does like, it's not going to stop this train from going. Mm -hmm. Like I, my little pebble is not stopping this freight train from running away. So, uh, and and I know that's, you can say, well, that's a terrible mentality because it's got to start somewhere. Well, that's great for you. (laughs) For me, (laughs) it goes back to what was the most expedient, right? right? I could pay 400 to $500 a month for my wife and I who are healthy and don't have anything. Or I could adjust my income because I'm a business owner. I can claim whatever I, not whatever I want within reason and make sure everything's all the I's mm-hmm. and T's are crossed. Get a there's a guy for that. <laughs> yeah, there's a tax, tax advisors for that. That's what Trump got, did what he was able to do. Same thing I do. No one's upset at him. Okay. Just use the system. Well, there's, tons of, there's tons of people who are upset at him, but guess what? If you're upset at me, I don't care because... I'm doing what is, is expedient and you're fighting for more government handouts. So just because I'm using the government handouts that are made, don't be upset. Okay. And if you <laughs> want to be upset, whatever, if that makes you happy, <laughs> how do you figure that oxymoron out? But, um, so I made a decision Well, I'm going to claim less income. I'm going to show my, I'm going to write off more of my business expenses so that I could have cheaper insurance. And I will continue to do that until it no longer makes sense to, or I can't feasibly make the numbers work. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, Which is great. Like I said, like I feel yeah. like in any system that exists, like you mentioned, it will continue to function, move, produce with or without you. So I'm also not against people in that situation. If you're a young college family, you just got you have no work or a young single mom with two kids, husband left. She doesn't, she works part time because she can't afford daycare. That woman can get almost free insurance. And I think that's great. But here's the problem in between them trying to regulate income. And in between the health insurance companies trying to remain profitable while offering these services at such a significantly lower rate, we have seen a 15 to 20% increase in health insurance premiums every year since Obamacare started. Right. And and if you look at it, it, you know, Sam here is a numbers guy, 15 for 20% increase in anything good or bad is crazy every year compounding since it started. Yeah. It's good if it's in your favor, but if it's compounding (laughs) expense that you'll ultimately grow into that you have to start paying, then it's not as attractive. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that happens with Obamacare specifically right now, I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic year, right? We had hundreds of thousands of people, lose jobs in the middle of the year and sign up for Obamacare, right? And because they'd lost their jobs, their income they reported was extremely low, if any at all, 
Now, what's going to happen to those people, right? They got that free health insurance plan or like it was eight bucks a month for their yes, families, something, something like that. But then all of a sudden they started working again and didn't update that. Now, what happens to that family? That plan that was probably a thousand dollars a month through the insurance company received a tax credit for let's say 910 for easy math, per, easy math purposes. So they're paying $90 a month for this health insurance plan. Now, because their income went back up at the end of the year when they report their taxes, it is that $910 that the government contributed to their plan every month times the number of months they were on that plan. That is the number they owe back in their taxes. If they don't report that their income went back up and subsequently started paying more for their health insurance every month. Well, okay. So, so let's just ask this question. Cause I've heard different things mm -hmm. from different people. It depends on who you talk to. So uh, what I've heard is there's an income threshold. So like if you're under, as you marry a couple and you're under $130,000 then the most that the government can actually come back and take from you is like 2,400. If you go over that, then they can go for the full amount. So what's, I, are you familiar? What's my with opinion? That? Yeah. Well, so I mean, like, yeah. So I don't do health insurance. There's I don't brackets, do taxes, right? The, so there's, there's. I do how to help you understand how money works and grow. That's why I'm asking. For sure. So people need to know this. Income brackets. Okay. Right. In, and they usually vary between you are between five and ten thousand dollars, right? And they they differ on different ages, right? The closer you get to sixty five by qualifying to Medicare, the smaller those brackets get, and the more more expensive they get as well. And so let's say you reported twenty thousand right? And you made 45,000. If you're a single dude in that scenario, you broke the threshold for a single guy, right? So you're paying the whole thing back. Now, if you're a family with four kids, with th two kids and a wife, and you reported 20 and then made 40, they won't go after the whole amount, but you have a penalty to include as well. So let's say instead of the $910, they're probably going to say, okay, well, you didn't apply, you didn't qualify for the 910, but you did qualify for 500. Okay. So then it's the difference of that. So $490 times the number of months you use the plan plus the penalty for using that tax credit wrongfully or illfully is the word they would use, right? Ill-advised. Ill-advised. Like mm -hmm. you intentionally screwed over the government. Right. You just didn't you weren't aware of that that was happening. Yeah, and unfortunately there's a lot of health insurance agents who will in an attempt to gain a client or say, hey, this is the case, right? They'll, they will personally put your income lower than you tell them. And they're now $200 less than the other guy you shopped with. So you go with what's less because it's expedient to you. You think it is, right? But really, you're getting, you're screwing yourself, right? And so understanding how that works is super crucial. And and as far as Obamacare is concerned, I'm glad we have it. I'm glad that you know, take my grandparents who are, are on Medicare. I'm glad that my grandpa who had like it was like a seven to seven bypass heart surgery last year. Like I didn't even know the heart had that many valves, right? He was able to get it, and it didn't cost him almost anything. But the problem with the system as, as it stands is that surgery that was hundreds of thousands of dollars and once you add up hospital bills and hospital stay bills, plus the care facility had to stay in for three months after his surgery, who is paying that, right? The health insurance company swallows it. It's a hard swallow. They hate it. So what happens to rates collectively, they go up to try not only compensate for that loss, but to ensure their profitability. Yeah. It's interesting. So what, I mean, like, cause that a lot of this was planned initially by mm -hmm. being offset by penalizing people who chose not to yeah. have insurance of any, everybody kind. had to participate, then, then they had to participate or they had to pay like 1200 bucks or mm -hmm. whatever. That's what was the original plan. Trump gets in, he eliminates the mandate. And as far as he's concerned, it's no longer Obamacare. Eh which is basically Obamacare. He overstates that in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's basically Obamacare without the mandate, but right. nothing really else has changed. Um, but that all of that $1,200 a month or $1,200 a year that was going to offset that is now not offset. And it hasn't for four years, at least uh, maybe two, two or three when that, because it officially ended, oh, okay. officially ended at the end of 2017. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but I'm still it might even been 18. But even then, people are saying it's going away. Are they really going to penalize me? And some were, some weren't. Right. Don't ask me how that system works because I don't know how they qualified who or didn't get penalized. Yeah, I don't, I don't know either. But I think like what 
what's the solution that you, from somebody in the industry, what, 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 what would need to happen or what ha- is going to have to happen for it to get either equalized or, or start to make sense again for private insurers? So, so at this point, I, I compare Obamacare to our U.S. postal system. Okay. It's not profit. The postal system is not profitable. It hasn't been for decades, and, but they started regulating it after nine 11, which I totally get right. You know, it used to have like lockers and storage bins at airports and never find them anymore. Right. And so I, I get why they took control of that system to help regulate that. But it, it's not new news that every system the government touches starts to fall to shambles to some degree. And so with Obamacare, what's happening, um, at least my opinion about how sure. it changes. All we have is perspective. Right? Oh, yeah, perspective is you, you need to deregulate it and let companies like U.S. Health Advisors, where I work, and other companies to compete with U.S. Health Advisors, just let the natural supply and demand of the economy bring the prices back down. But how does that affect? Because I, mean, I think the biggest concern is people who – U.S. health advisor so, went in touch with a ten foot pole, and that's where like we're there's there, there's the there's discrepancy there. Yeah, there's a massive discrepancy. Mm-hmm. There's lots of people. I was talking to a client today. She's like, "Look, we're trying to get onto my parents' mm-hmm. plan, but I'm pregnant. I'm gonna have a baby in three months or six mm-hmm. months, and nobody wants to insure me mm-hmm. unless it's during open enrollment. So, mm-hmm. so how do you manage that? With like, yes, there's there are people with pre existing conditions, right? That can't just get on any USL. So most insurance. people don't know is you could go to select health right now and you could purchase a plan disconnected from the marketplace. Now you're paying full price for it, which is, has been 15 to 20% increase every year, for every year since, <laughs> since it started. Okay. So sure. it's now astronomically expensive. Okay. But there's always been different qualifiers for insurance companies. Most of which went out of business when Obamacare came into play because they could no longer retain enough clients to make the bills they would eventually pay out profitable. The the return never made sense. Now what to do with that, right? Not only are insurance companies trying to compensate for Medicare and Medicaid, it's a part of your taxes. Yes. Okay. So, so there's, there's not, there's not just one stream of availability to take care of people with preexisting conditions or take care of people who are older and qualify for Medicare. They're already doing it. Now to say that that would remain that way, I don't think it would. I think all of a sudden if we said, Hey, no more subsidized plans, I still think we'd have, there'd be a huge discrepancy for at least eight months to a year where the market would have to adjust to it. And they'd have to just start opening up and it happens in life insurance where you have like every uh, so many people are like why did i get rated look you're better off being so so in a life insurance policy there's probably on average shoot i don't know probably 10 to 12 maybe more different ratings and every rating when you get rated um you get put into a different pool of insurance. Right. So um, what you don't want is a company who's going to approve everybody into the best rating. If you're a healthy person, you don't want everybody to get approved in a healthy rating because then that means more people actually need to draw on that and then your price goes up. Mm -hmm. And so you actually want it segmented to where every health rating is in its own pool and they can cost share in that pool. Um, but that does create a problem for lower income individuals who have health issues who then have their really expensive insurance. So I don't know how mm-hmm. an insurance company could subsidize that without saying the health people have to pay. It comes down to, to the them. fundamental thought. It is health care an inalienable, inalienable human right. And I just, I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people do. And I think everyone, I think every baby should be, deserves to be born in a hospital and and have the right to have the best chance of living. Okay. Now, do I believe that you can go up to the doctor and anyone who listens to this podcast will know doctors and think of someone, okay, who went to school for 15 years. $300,000 Three hundred to six hundred thousand dollars into debt on their head. That's conservative, right? If they oh, specialize, yeah. it's even more than that. And med school, their residency, plus their licensing, and then on top of that, there are hundreds of thousands a year in malpractice insurance. The fact that someone can go up there and says, "You're going to treat me for free," it, 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 there's not a reality where I go oh, that, that that makes sense, <laughs> right? 
Yeah, and so, I mean, debate with it what you will. There are some people, there's some people even in my office who work in health insurance who say, hey, that's that's totally wrong. You, you can't say that if someone's dying, they should receive treatment. But I mean, not that natural, we've stopped natural selection for a large portion as a society, right? People who are living longer than typically would have, you know, it, it's no longer a part. We can make, we can literally keep someone who's brain dead physically alive for, for years, right? We have the equipment to do it. Now, whether that's ethical or not, you, we can debate it, but I don't personally believe that, I don't know where to draw the line. I don't even know who can draw the line to say, this would no longer be treatable. But guess what we're about to do it in Utah? In Utah in the next two weeks, they are gonna start rationing healthcare services due to COVID. So if you've got a 40 year old COVID patient and a six year old COVID patient and that need a ventilator, they're turning the six year old away. They're turning the six-year-old, not the 40-year-old? They're higher risk. They're less likelihood of living. See, I think it should go the other way because the 40-year-old has a higher chance of, of, li of living. So, but longevity to contribute to society in what way? You know what I mean? That's their call. That, that, that's, that's I, I get it. It's a fine. And here's, right. here's, here's and the line that I, don't, I would never know or assume to know how to draw. And I don't know who's drawing that line there. I mean, the Salt Lake Tribune, for those of you who are here in Utah, they're listening to this. That's, that's their saying. Like, hey, if there's someone who's higher risk, right, why we could treat them, the person who's going to be more likely to recover to open that ventilator again, that's the person we're treating. Here, here, here's, a, here's a dark, and this isn't dark humor. This uh -huh. is just a reality. Your computer's beeping at you, battery, by the way. Oh, thanks. I can fix that. <laughs> so, but here's a reality, okay? And I, I don't, you can go find these statistics. I looked it up right when uh, Obamacare, not Obamacare, when, uh, oh, what's, what are we talking about? COVID. Mm -hmm. When COVID's happened and they decided as a country, we decided to print seven trillion dollars now most people are going to say oh you only printed three trillion or two trillion because they want to keep the numbers low but they bailed out a lot of massive banks they bailed out a lot of big companies and all of it together combined is like seven trillion the stimulus package that they passed just for the americans it was only like three trillion and, and again do the math on this as well three like a trillion seconds ago is like thousands bc mm-hmm and 2900 BC was a thousand seconds ago. So when you think about seven trillion dollars, that's an enormous number. Then, um, but but this is a this is a key. When we come and talk about cars, what has the government decided is the value of a life when it comes to public transportation or just transportation in general? Okay, about seven million dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, one life is worth about seven million dollars, according to the government. Bureau of whoever decides whether they are going to require seatbelts or change a speed limit sign or, or or require a new safety feature on a car. They have to say, is this going to, yes, it's going to cost X amount of dollars to mandate this imp implementation. Is it going to save this many lives? And there's a threshold of like, if it's not going to save a certain amount of lives by adding this in there, th then it doesn't work out. And, th and they draw that as like every life. So if it costs 50 billion dollars to, to do it, then they divide 50 billion by how many lives it's going to save. And if that number is more than 7 million, then they don't do it. If it's under 7 million, then they do it because they're like, okay, this is the value of a life. Well, with COVID actual deaths, not the hypothetical, all the crap that they say on the media of how many people died from COVID. But if you look at the actual percentages of people who have died, it was like 63 million dollars is what they valued every life when they printed all that money for COVID. Like they, they more almost 10 times any other statistic in the government of what a, a human value, a human life is valued at, they 10 times it for COVID, which is insanity. Like, and, and again, I'm, I'm not saying that, I, that you should put a price on life, but on the other hand, at some point we have to put a price on life. We have to do it with an insurance war. actuary. That's what he does. Yeah. I and mean, we have to put a price on life, any insurance actuary, but even, even, um, Keaton with this property, right. Mm -hmm. that, that he had, we talked about at the beginning, at some point you have to put a price on whether blackmail is easier just to pay it or to fight it. Right. Mm -hmm. there, there's a price at which you're like, okay, I'm a hundred grand into this. This property isn't worth a hundred grand. Take it. I'm done. 
Mm-hmm. Right. I've, I've now spent more, my pride. I can get rid of my pride. I'd rather wash my hands of this thing than keep fighting for something that I'm never going to recoup my money from. And this is a sunk cost area where our students, a lot of students, I, I pick on students, but <laughs> they'll go to college and they'll get three years in. They're like, I can't quit now. I'm three years in. It's like, yeah, but you absolutely know you're never going to finish that. Like, you're never going to use your degree. You're mm-hmm. never going to use any of that. Well, I'm three years in. My parents think I should. It's some cost theory, right? You're better off just ditching the thirty thousand dollars you spent on your education thus far and going and making money somewhere else. Not spend another ten just to get a piece of paper that you're never going to use. Mm-hmm. That won't make you any more qualified to do something you want to do. Absolutely. So, so anyways, those are like the hard truths that like we got it. I don't know what the answer is. Keaton doesn't know what the answer is. Mm-hmm. I don't think our justices in the Supreme Court know what the answer is. No. And even if they claim to, no one would believe them. No. <laughs> I mean, yeah. You think Trump knows what the answer is? No. The only way you could possibly, quote unquote, know what the answer is, is when you start saying, this is what we're going to value human life. We make it a mathematical, emotionless equation, and we make a decision. Just like what Keaton said about me, right? Money is just going to sit there, and there's no emotion to it. It's just going to do what it does. And that if we can remove the emotion, we're going to be a lot more successful. And that's where one side of the political aisle is like, look, was it worth setting down, shutting down our entire economy for saving a few people's lives? Because that's the shutting down of the GDP. That was on top of printing $63 trillion for each person who dies. Crazy. Isn't that just mind blowing? No, it's insane. But like you said, the, the government has oh. a funny way of whatever it touches to either reduce its efficiency or the program itself actually ceases to function how it was designed, which is why the health insurance I work with and I chose to specialize in with you as health advisors takes the politics out of health insurance, right? Is it so political and do people still, are there still going to be things to complain about? Yeah. Health insurance isn't designed to cover everything, but it's designed to mitigate your risk with what could happen to you. Right? So with you as health advisors, the idea being is, that instead of being based off your income or where you work or how you work or what industry you work in, um, if you get a rate based on your health period, which means for a 40 year old who makes $40,000 or a 40 year old who makes a million dollars in a year, the price is going to be the same for those two individuals. As long as our health is as long as our health is. And I say health, like you don't have to be on the front of men's fitness magazine, right? If you typically, if you work, if you work in, If you're working full time and you don't go to the doctor more than, I don't know, four or five times a year, you can typically count as healthy, right? Now, pre-existing conditions, if you had cancer last year, I can't help you, right? But guess what? There are plans that can, right? And that's where the government steps in and I'm grateful for that. Yep. Like I said, we were were a blessed country for trying to create that system. And I think lots of people benefit from it and they should continue to benefit for it. But no matter who gets elected soon, there will be health care reform. Yeah. And none of us know what that's going to look like. Nope. I don't know. (laughs) I couldn't tell you. But I was listening to a podcast, Bradley podcast. Um, Eric War is worth going and listening Mm -hmm. to. He said, look, he's been an entrepreneur business owner for 40 plus years. And no matter who gets elected, it doesn't affect an entrepreneur because entrepreneurs adapt and they're going to be successful no matter what the regulation is, no matter what taxes are, they'll find a way to minimize their taxation, right? You know that the, the, those that are powers that be, the people who are elected, they're not raising taxes on themselves. True. They're not. And so what do you have to do to play by their rules? It's the only thing. Like once you identify the, the only problem with Trump paying whatever he paid in taxes is that he played by a politician's rules. And now the politicians don't like that. He's exposing how they're all playing Mm -hmm. by the same rules. So, um, anyways, that, that, that's a very common, very real thing, um, that the rules are out there. If you don't know them, then you need to talk to people like Keaton because he can help you. Even if, even if you're like, am I in the best health insurance? Mm -hmm. Even if you have health insurance through a spouse, right? Because even with the health insurance through a spouse, the company you work at is because of making it affordable for the employee will pay a portion for the employee, but they're not legally required to cover anything for the rest of the family. And so full price or employer for someone who isn't the employee of the company can still be hundreds of dollars less a month on a health-based plan. Yeah, isn't that crazy? That's just so crazy. 
I love it, guys. Please follow Keaton. Where, where do they get a hold of you? Like, if they really want to shop out their insurance, and what states just do you not work in? Because I've got people who, <laughs> I, I know this, and it sucks, I have to say this, but there are some states that just. Right now, they've got, we got Oregon, we can't do California as a rough one. Uh, New Mexico is kind of on the line. If you were, if you are in New Mexico, contact me and we can find some loopholes there. New York is another one that's hard just because they're currently closed down their entire state for, for COVID stuff. And they're not letting a lot of people that don't live in the state of New York, even write policies and, and attempt to keep the insurance business there. Yeah, um, New York is stupid. <laughs> that's fine. But I've got a Facebook page. Sam has a link to it and he can, he can either drop it or attach it to this. And also I just easiest ways to book my calendar. I do free health insurance consultations. Anybody in the United States in the next from November 1st, to December 15th, has to pick a new plan to cover them for 2021. And so no matter where you're at, what situation you're in, my time for you guys is free because I'm paid by insurers to help you out. And so that being the case, make sure you look me up. I can help you shop. I can tell you what you have. I can tell you what you don't have. And overall help protect your wealth and even more so your health, which is you know, without that, you, you can't even get to the point where you can build wealth progressively if you can't even function even basic bodily functions to get to work on time yeah you got you got to contact him so facebook keaton it's k-e-a-t-o-n his last name is patey i think i said his name wrong for many years <laughs> um, but i'm gonna look up something for most people here. say oh pate i'm like i'm really not that fancy pate. <laughs> keaton, pate. yeah no that's not it um yeah, you can also reach him at keatonpady.com. And that's, you can schedule with him at keatonpady.com. So just type in keatonpady.com and it'll take you straight to his scheduling link. You can schedule a call and get um, get that taken care of. Okay, so thank you so much, Keaton. Yep. Super appreciate you being here and sharing your wonderful knowledge with us. I hate health insurance. So I bring other people on to talk about it. <laughs> it's not for me. Well, hey, we'll catch you guys next time on the Fuel Your Legacy Client Show. Take care, guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Your Legacy.